Well, good morning. I'm Gene Getz, and today I'm sitting in the seat of uh, Thomas Pickett. <laughs> Normally, uh, Tom, you're in this chair. You're interviewing other people, and yes. today I have the opportunity to interview you. Pastor Tom Pickett, the senior pastor in Euless, Texas, a church called Grace Communion International, and he's also the director of a Time to Reconcile ministry, which includes a weekly radio program, and that's what we're involved in today, Tom. Yes, yeah. And Thank you, you. You do this good weekly. To, good, and, to, uh, yeah, good to be here with you today. Well, and I'm delighted that I can uh, kind of put you in another role and uh, <laughs> interview you because sometimes it's easier to share your story when somebody else is asking you to <laughs> share your story. Well, that's true. Yeah, and it comes across a little bit better, I think. Mm-hmm. You've had an interesting spiritual journey. You came from the Worldwide Church of God. And boy, that brings back memories because I remember even as a young professor at Moody Bible Institute and then at Dallas Seminary, I used to watch Garner Ted Armstrong, mm -hmm. who yes. took over after his dad, Herbert W. Armstrong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I first heard him on radio. Mm -hmm. And yes. then, of course, I, I saw... Garner Ted on television. I was rather captivated with uh, the message. I knew that there was an interesting dynamic there theologically that uh, created a problem for me. But, but you were in a church in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. You were pastoring. You were part of the Worldwide Church of mm -hmm. God. Yes. And then something happened, which I don't think has ever happened in church history in terms of the whole process of a group of people that would be classified as a cult mm -hmm. yes. in the sense that you didn't believe in uh, the Trinity. Right. You didn't believe in salvation by grace through faith, per se, or mm -hmm. the born-again experience. You kept all of the Sabbath rules. Mm -hmm. uh, Holy days. And the festivals. Mm -hmm. right. And all of that was a part of this whole community, very exclusive, mm -hmm. Yes, looking outward on other people as not having the truth. And then a reformation took place. Yes, and it you did. you were right in the middle of it. Talk about it. Well, it was very confusing, even shocking at first. Uh, it was such a change from what we had believed. And uh, it took a while for that to kind of settle in. Uh, I didn't revolt because I'd always been taught to prove all things and hold fast to that which is true. And so because I had been taught that principle, I, uh, I wanted to study it out before I made a decision. Now, you were, you were actually a pastor. Yes. And, uh, and, of course, we have a mutual friend, Felix Heimberg. Oh, yes, we do. And Felix is pastoring a church here in Dallas, Texas. Yes, he is. While you were out mm -hmm. there. Did you know each other at the time? We, we weren't in contact at that very moment, but uh, even though to. Felix had been our best man at our wedding. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. you were close in that yes. sense. Mm -hmm. But he went through a process, a seven-year process here with one of the largest churches, at least in the Dallas area of the Worldwide Church of God, moving in seven years from law to grace. You're here in Harrisburg going through the same process. Yes, now, I understand, and Felix has been a source of a lot of information for me, but this whole process started at the top once uh, Herbert W. passed on mm -hmm. and then began to open cracks within the theological system. Talk, can you talk about sure. that for a few moments? Well, uh, Herbert Armstrong appointed Joseph de Koch to be the successor uh, to him. And he was the right man. God was choosing the right man then to be able to reveal some things to him that he didn't know before. And that began by uh, a priest of the Catholic Church writing into our headquarters asking why we didn't believe in the Trinity. Oh, that's where it began. Yes. And so uh, Mr. Descartes gave to his doctrinal committee that commission to prove to the priest why we don't believe in the Trinity. And they went to their offices to work that out, and they couldn't prove it anymore. They could no longer prove that there was not a trinity. Now, you also had some professors, I think, in some of your colleges that were beginning to raise some of those same questions? Perhaps so, but I, I think that the main group were in Pasadena, California, who were 
working with church administration in the administrative part of it in in the, the city where our headquarters was located. So the first crack, as it were, in the th tight theological system that was expressed in all these booklets that were made available some 70 or 80 by uh, Herbert mm -hmm. W., mm -hmm. that, that whole thing began to crumble. Yes, it did, one brick at a time. But the main thing that affected us almost immediately was the cultural stress of the change. We were all connected culturally to each other. And that began to unravel almost immediately uh, because we, uh, we realized that there had been such major doctrinal shifts at that moment that it, it undid the cultural strength we had as a group. And part of that, part of that cohesion, I guess we could call it, was because it was really top down. Yes, it couldn't have happened any other way. In other words, um, uh, Herbert W. had established the culture, the theology. Everybody basically believed that he spoke ex cathedra, as it were. I mean, anything he said was true. Yes. And and then they controlled it strongly from the top. Everybody had to cross their T's, dot their I's. They were yes, they did. indoctrinated into the system through the colleges. But once they began to question it at the top. Well, then it was, uh, you know, because, you know, he always said, Herbert Armstrong always said, you show to me that I'm wrong in the Bible and I will change. Uh, of course, no one dared to show him <laughs> where they thought he was wrong over time. So it took a change of uh, leadership. And God obviously orchestrated that. And Joseph Tkach was a very humble man. So he was listening. He was shown yeah. something new. And he was he knew what would happen. And he tried to, you know, have it not go that way, but you know, culture is so strong, you know, in people's lives that we're afraid to go into something we don't understand fully. It's very fearful. Yes. Now, I know Felix here in Dallas, he, he went through, it's a seven-year, basically, process. The mm -hmm. whole group went through, and I know he was with that group from, for seven years, which was very stressful. Yes. And uh, about half the people uh, followed the teachings of grace, and half of them basically stayed in their old system. How did that affect you? You're in another situation, very similar. Well, there were two major things that I focused on. And one was the fact, the difference between the Old and the New Covenant. That distinguishing fact was established through Jesus' death on the cross. The New Covenant was born when he died and rose again from the dead. The Old Covenant was completely finished and he fulfilled every aspect of it himself personally. And so when you don't bring in the Old Covenant anymore for doctrinal instruction and you look to the new teachings of Jesus to set your course for your religious life, then that makes a big difference. And yeah, I, I all the difference in the world. Yes, and I came to understand that fully. Take just the Sabbath. Yeah, that just was the major one, right. Talk about that, because well, that, be, that had to be traumatic. Well, very much so. Our whole lives were geared around the Sabbath and preparing for the Sabbath. And uh, how do you keep the Sabbath? And, and then that includes the Holy Days, too. So when we realize that Jesus is now our Sabbath, he is our rest, well, then that allows us to worship every day of the week if we want to. Without, or any day. Or any day, right. So... That was, that was critical to my being at peace with the changes. The second, of course, we've already covered in part, and that is coming to know the triune nature of our God through the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we recognized all three of those in the Bible, but we didn't connect them as one. That was our mistake. How did that affect your relationship with Jesus Christ because, and I asked that question because I talked with another one of your, your friends mm -hmm. or brothers mm -hmm. 
where he, for the first time, began to realize that he could communicate with Jesus, he could talk with Jesus, he could fellowship with Jesus because he was one with the Father. And he said it, it was just an unbelievable experience. With me, I, I was baptized as a Southern Baptist person. Before you became? Before I became a member of the Worldwide Church of God. Oh, okay. So, so you, weren't already, brought, you weren't I, brought up in no, it? No, I wasn't. Okay. As, as my wife was brought up in it. Okay. But I was not. And therefore, I already had a relationship with, with Jesus. Jesus. I never lost that when I was going through all the things I went through with the Worldwide Church of God. And so I never felt that I didn't have that relationship. But it certainly has intensified much more since coming into the transformed way of thinking about who he is that I have today and understand the, how the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one and how that is the true expression of love in the universe. Now you're beginning the process. It takes seven years. The whole group uh, change took seven years, as I understand. And according to a Christianity Today interview, a historian said this is probably the first time in, in history that a group, uh, a cult as, as it was defined, moved to become a part of the evangelical community. Talk about that seven years. I mean, what's, what happened? I mean, that just had to be traumatic. Well, it, it certainly was. And um, once I settled who I was as a pastor still in the Worldwide Church of God that would become the Grace Communion International. Um, I was okay. But How long did that take? Well, actually, I must say that it, it probably it took a couple of years, and I came into the understanding about reconciliation, and that was the uh, icing on the top of the cake. Uh, that sealed everything together for me personally. You know, the brethren, they had more issues to work through than I did after that because that really did solidify my whole appreciation of what had just happened to me as a person. And as a pastor, then I tried to help the brethren come to that same understanding of how we are one together with God through Jesus Christ in relationship of the most intense kind. And that... That sealed the deal for me. So Now, where is that sealing the deal event happening within the timeline? Um, well, it, uh, 95 was when the transformation began. And it, in 1998, we had um, a conference in Harrisburg where I was pastoring, uh, a conference on reconciliation. And it was basically focusing on racial reconciliation to help our own people uh, understand the need to be more in, in oneness with, you know, the races we had within our own fellowship. But that opened the door for me. And I said, yes, I, you can host it here in Harrisburg. And uh, Curtis May, who was the one who was spearheading that, he is now the Director of Reconciliation and Mediation at our headquarters today. I asked him what I should do in preparation for him coming. Now, but this is a, man, a person who was a part of the Worldwide Church of he God, was, he but was, he went through the Reformation. But right. he's, he's about uh, three or four years into this process. So, it's, let's say three years. Yeah. And um, so, I s said to him, what should I do? He said, call Sherry Steinvender, who's in Houston, Texas. And she is with the uh, uh, Center for the Healing of Racism. And I called Sherry. And this is not particularly a religious group? No. Uh, it Social? Was, it was uh, just more practical. Okay. And uh, so I called Sherry and she said, well, if you really want to be successful in having your conference there, I suggest you do four things. So she said, do you have a piece of paper and pencil? Write these things down. First, I want you to go to your mayor and your city council and invite them personally to come to the conference. Then I want you to go to all the pastors of your city and invite them to come. And I had never reached out to anybody like that before. And then you need to invite all the representatives of the different races in your city 
to come, personally invite them, and then invite the whole city. Throw the net over the whole city and invite them all. Wow. I uh, <laughs> <laughs> bet you thought, what, what well, am I into here? It, surprisingly enough, I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, and for the next nine months before the conference started, I was out... I was inviting everybody. In fact, the mayor even changed a street name for us for that weekend from division to unity. Oh, in other <laughs> words, there's a street that ran by the meeting place, yes. <laughs> which said division. Division Street. Yeah. <laughs> so for a day? For actually two days for the weekend. Yeah. He you know, just blotted out or put over a I sleeve. Put a sleeve, or a sleeve <laughs> over the sign, yeah. To Unity Street. To Unity Street, yeah. So the mayor had to be excited. What uh, was he? Uh, uh, African American himself? No, he was not. He was a white man. Uh -huh. um, but uh, in fact, he couldn't make it. He was out of town that weekend. But uh, several council members were there, representing the city. Okay. And um, did and you did you speak? I uh, I introduced some some of the ones who were speaking. So you brought in people that were part of this reformation within the World Wide Church of God, or did you reach out into both the evangelical community? Both. Both those who were a part of our group who had the message to share, as well as those in the city who had something to share on the topic of reconciliation. Like Now, obviously, the heart of your passion and this conference mm -hmm. is the message of reconciliation, as we know in Scripture. Yes that we're reconciled to God through faith in Jesus Christ, and because we are, we should be reconciled to each other. How did that message go over with people that probably didn't even understand it? That was a harder message to convey in its fullness. And it, I come to understand about reconciliation, you have to be patient. The message is wonderfully freeing, but to embrace it, People are saying, mm, I don't know. Well, they have to embrace a, a basic, uh, if it's biblical, they've got to embrace a theological tenet that Jesus Christ is God and he came to reconcile us with the Father. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I can see you'd have to walk through that rather gingerly so they don't walk out the door. And patiently, you know, because... I found it to be a harder subject to understand than one would believe. I I believe it so, you know, passionately that I would say, how could you, could you not believe in this? But the thing I understand about Scripture and how it can be viewed, because I have misviewed it myself. Gives you an understanding. Yes, it and does. sympathy. Mm -hmm. Now, how did you feel about the result of that conference? Was it? I was very pleased with it. We... Uh, we made the local news, and uh, we uh, I was all geared to have another one the next year, but God, God called me here to Fort Worth, Texas. Okay, uh, and, and timeline on that. So the seven, the whole change was about seven years as far as the, your whole larger community mm -hmm. to, uh, to what it's now called in relationship to Grace Communion International. Where in the timeline did you leave to come to Dallas-Fort Worth? 1999. So seven years, where's that? In the well, so I was 95 to 99. So that's four years into the seven years. Okay. And I came into a church area that was not uh, doing well. The pastor has not had not, you know, embraced the changes. and. So you had to pick up that mm -hmm. in the middle of the, of the process. Of the process, yeah. What happened to the group that you left? Uh, they didn't do as well because they got uh, someone who wasn't really that loving toward them. Uh, and he didn't shepherd them well. Did he uh, believe, though, in he, the changes? He said he did. and uh, But he didn't translate it into a loving approach to the people. Well, and more, that... more more, of a... Uh, theoretic view of and, who they were. Yeah. And we could say probably... And here we're going to talk about motive, but basically, or personality, I think basically there are certain personalities that the, certain theologies they feel more comfortable with. And being within that system, it was pretty dogmatic. Yes. 
And so to change from being a dogmatic preacher, teacher, to being a pastor, counselor, loving person, that takes transformation. Well, itself. it does. That is so true. Yeah. Now, we'll talk about Fort Worth. So you drop into the middle of this. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it was, um, I'd been taught in Harrisburg how to network. So I began networking here in, in the Fort Worth area and somewhat in the Dallas area. But uh, that's now become a little bit more that way as far as networking with some in Dallas area. You actually uh, hosted another mm -hmm. conference uh, in Farmer's Branch in 2010. Mm -hmm. uh, you had a lot of experience leading up to this. Yes. So compare the two. Well, I uh, <clears throat> found out that, uh, you know, people are busy. And uh, if you don't understand how reconciliation impacts you, you don't really see the point of spending a weekend at that kind of conference. at that type of venue. But what did happen is that we, we were able to uh, showcase any number of ministries that involve the ministry of reconciliation and all the expressions in a community. And we had a number of workshops that expressed those different uh, looking at need and then seeing what one's response could be to help reconcile it. So how many did you have attending that conference? Well, it was only attended by about 150 people, but it was very powerful. I wish more could have been there. We, uh, I invited hundreds of people to come. And, um, but again, it's to see the application of reconciliation in your living, uh, other than just race or some obvious expressions like that, that's a harder sell. But once you, once you get involved in it, you see the value of it. And that's the thing. And that's the thing that takes time. And uh, that's where you are today. And of course, this radio program actually mm -hmm. came out of your passion yes, for it did. that. I understand uh, Hank, I think is his Aldridge, first name. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Is he out of the same background as you're out? No, no, no he's uh, he's not. He grew up in uh, Burleson, Texas area. But he really, he really resonated with Identified with it, with it. yes, with he the did. the concept mm -hmm. of reconciliation, so he invited you to... Be on his radio... Radio program and... His radio station that he was working for at the time. And you're still on. Still on. Going that's into why the we're fifth, talking. Going into <laughs> the fifth year, that's right. Well, that's exciting, and as we close out... Uh, what are your plans for the future? Well, I'd like to see if I can find a radio station in Dallas, Texas, because KCLE is a wonderful station, but it doesn't cover the Dallas area with its signal. So I'd like to be able to see if that's what God is putting on my heart to do. Well, hopefully that will work. My special guest, and I'm actually in his chair today interviewing Pastor Thomas Pickett, the senior pastor in Euless, Texas, for Grace Community International. Also, the director of A Time to Reconcile Ministry, which includes this weekly radio program. I'm Gene Getz, and thanks, Tom, for inviting me to sit in the interviewer's chair. Well, thank you, Gene. To talk to you about reconciliation. Amen. I want to thank you for listening to the program this week. Hopefully it has been of value to you.